As noted already, this is Labor Day weekend. We are also starting a new church year, and we'll mark that soon with a blessing ritual. We're also celebrating First Sunday Communion. We're also collecting a food offering today. We're also living in a time of intense political turmoil and culture wars and mutual hostility, which bleeds over into the church. We're also inundated with news of natural disaster and drought and war and refugee crises and, and, and luckily we have a scripture passage today that speaks to every one of those realities equally well. I just love how scripture does that time and again. The Bible is culturally specific for the time, place, and circumstance for which it was written, and it still speaks frequently and pointedly and brilliantly into the challenges of life that we face today. Scripture is a rich resource for the life God intends us to live. So let's open it to Romans 12. One of my all-time go-to passages. I've probably preached from this text more than any other in my lifetime. I didn't count, but I'm guessing. I'll dive into some of the details, but first let me give you the wide view in a phrase. This is a chapter about respecting God's space. Respecting God's space. I think I'm coining that phrase because I searched for it on the internet and it appears nowhere. And we all know if Google can't find it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> but the idea started for me with verse 19 in Romans 12. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. Leave room. I have a hunch that leaving room can apply to many attributes of God besides wrath, and it can apply to God's very being. But what does it really mean for us to leave room for God? To not leave room for God to act, to do, and to be as God wills is to crowd in on God. It is to disrespect God's space. Respecting someone else's personal space is a concept that most of us easily understand. And I know different cultures define personal space differently. But every culture has some boundaries, some imaginary lines that define and protect one's personal space. To respect someone else's space is to acknowledge their legitimate personhood, their worth, their power, their agency, or in other words, their ability to choose and to act on their own behalf. To not respect someone else's space is and to, or to encroach on their space, or to cross their boundaries without their invitation, is to violate their personhood. It is to deny their worth and dignity. It is to take their power from them. Now, we understand how this works between people. Did we ever consider that it might also apply to how we relate to God? God, we say in our confessions of faith, is a being with infinite worth and power and agency. And we are created to be God's junior partners in service to God, in service to God's mission in the world. But one of the most insidious and persistent of temptations is our temptation to encroach on God's territory. 
to usurp God's authority, to get in God's way, to undermine God's intention for us and for others. We make ourselves out to be God. We make God into our image instead of the other way around. And whenever we do that, we are worshiping something that is not God. We call that idolatry. We call it sin. So back to Romans 12, I began to see that this whole chapter is about leaving room for God, about respecting God's space. And that idea turned this text upside down in a way, in a surprising way. Because it reads like a Christian to-do list. Perfect for a Labor Day sermon. Nothing like a, a long list of biblical imperatives to inspire people who are proud of their work ethic. Do this and that, and the other thing, and don't do this or that or that thing over there. It's a blue ribbon text for people like me with an overdeveloped sense of responsibility. But wait just a minute. As we read down this list of commands, I see a lot that asks me to let go, to step back, to release, and nothing that tells me to grab hold or assume control or manage the situation. Just look at this command in verse 10. Be devoted to one another in love. When I'm devoted to someone else in love, that by definition limits how devoted I can be to controlling my outcome and managing my agenda. Love embraces risk for the sake of another. Like the classic line, to love someone is to let them go. Or this command, also in verse 10, honor one another above yourselves. If I do that, I risk the possibility that the other may make choices I do not personally like or approve of. But I honor their personhood anyway, above my own. And the command in verse 12, be patient in affliction. It's not about a quick fix for our affliction. Patience may be required for a lifetime. If I think my future happiness depends on my ability to rid myself of my affliction, I might end up being deeply disillusioned. And verse 12 commands, share with those in need, practice hospitality. We don't get to dictate what needy people do with our compassion. Whenever we give time, money, talents, or other resources, we must remind ourselves that these are gifts. A giver lets go once the gift is given. And the practice of hospitality there is no spiritual practice that requires more risk, more vulnerability, more letting go than the practice of hospitality. Hospitality is opening wide your arms to the other. It's a position of vulnerability. I'm saying my door is open, my life is open. It's the opposite of grasping or seizing control. And go on down the rest of the list of commands in Romans 12, then they nearly all read the same way. Bless those who persecute you. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with others. 
associate with the lowly. And as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. These are all about leaving room for God. By respecting God's space that we encounter in the other. That's right, we affirm God's real presence and image in the lives of all our co-humans. Respecting God's space in them requires that we show a deep reverence and humility in our interactions with others, especially those we don't understand or agree with. Otherwise, our confession of faith in God's love for all people means nothing. And back to verse 19 where this phrase is embedded, the Apostle Paul writes, leave room for God's wrath or anger. Leave room. Anger is rampant today. Absolutely rampant. Almost anyone can get set off today for anything. We are as prone to that as, as others as well. So this is a challenge written for our age. When we find ourselves at such deep odds with our neighbors, with other professing Christians, with members of our own family. Are we ready to truly see God's image in our political and theological opposites? Are we willing to respect God's space in that other, to acknowledge their worth, their power, their agency, their inherent goodness. You know, if we could all learn to respect God's space in each other, what a different world we would be living in. But you know, I don't have to wait until we all figure that out together. I can start today. Noticing God's presence in the other and respecting God's space in the other. And the world will start looking different today for me. We all have our own convictions, beliefs, plans, and priorities, and that's all well and good. But let's leave room for God and for God's work. Leaving room for God is a challenge for us as individuals and as a church community. As we begin another church year together, begin our 70th year, to be precise, it's a good time to take a look at how we order our life together and how we leave room for God to move among us. There are different metaphors that we have used to talk about this, and one of them is a garden plot. We see ourselves as a garden and check out the language there at the top. A garden where everyone is working together to create a space for God the gardener to work. I know the text is small, you may not be able to read it, but I'll, I'll read it for you. I forgot that those words were there until I finished preparing my sermon. At the heart of our church structure, is the stated desire that we respect God's space so that God can work. <laughs> Let's pray we can live into that. 
At the start of a new church year, some people have moved into some new roles in the garden, and some others are continuing the roles that they already had. We today want to bless and encourage and commission each other as we begin a new year together. So first, I want to help you find where you are in this garden and where others are. So here's a quick overview. There's the governance side, where council is in the middle, and there's the mission and ministry side, where the elder team is in the middle. On the council are chair and vice chair and six members and pastors and treasurer and other staff meet with them. Reporting to the council and relating to the council directly are the finance committee that works on our annual spending plan and helps us steward our, our funds and, and accounts. There's a building and grounds consultant group that takes special care of our grounds and our building, and you'll see some people doing that from time to time. There's a nominating committee that works at discerning who, who is best called to, to be in some of these groups and provide leadership and counsel and elders. There's the Child Protection Committee that works at implementing our safe church policy, keeping children and everyone safe. There's memory garden trustees who look after the space to the south of the building where we uh, bury cremains or put them in niches and uh, provide a, a, a lasting memorial for those who've died of our community. The Educational Grants Committee uh, discerns how to distribute the funds for supporting people to attend Mennonite uh, secondary and higher education. And we send people to Virginia Mennonite Conference and to Mennonite Church USA delegate assemblies on our behalf. Then on the mission and ministry side, the elders look after that side together as a team. It's chaired by Lauren Schwarzenjuber. There are four ministry elders um, and financial caregiving elders and the three pastors on that team. And we have four areas of ministry that we focus on. Worship. That uh, team is, um, is led or walked alongside by a pastor elder pair of my, myself, along with Laura Yoder, and we seek to support all those who are involved in worship. And you know all the people who are involved in worship of all kinds, from technical to arts to music and beyond. Incarnational witness, uh, many things that we do here to reach out beyond our four walls and uh, I work alongside Donna Shank, elder, as a pair in, on that team to give special attention to those uh, and support to those working it in these various ways. Community building is another area of, of ministry, and Pastor Paula works alongside Donna Mast to support those um, working with small groups and care ministers and uh, retreat and coffee houses and food and fellowship times, all kinds of things, to build our connections to one another. Faith formation is for all ages, so Pastor Mariah, along with Carissa Gredler, pay attention to and walk alongside those giving leadership to um, the youth and children ministries and other ways that we form faith. Um, kind of connecting these two sides, we sometimes call them side A and side B, but connecting these two sides are the chair of council, who is currently Merle Mast, uh, Chair of Elders, uh, currently Lauren Schwarzenjuber and myself. We're not a decision-making group, but we make sure that the group, two sides are talking to each other and are aware of what's happening. So there's the garden. You're in it. So we want to bless and encourage and commission everyone who's actively working in the garden that we call Parkview Mennonite Church. Some of you carry multiple roles in that garden, some just one or two. But I don't think anyone is excluded from that garden. If you're here this morning in worship, you're in the garden. If you smile and greet somebody else that you meet today and help them feel part of our community, you're in the garden. If you offer a thought or a question in the Faith Formation Hour, you're in the garden. If you helped out with Kids Club or served food at our recent block party, you're in the garden, and the list never ends. So this prayer of blessing is for you. 
I will read the leader part, and all of us together, all of us are invited to respond with a hearty and full-voiced amen whenever we get there. So are you ready? May God, who calls you to this ministry, grant you grace, joy, and endurance. Amen. Amen. May Christ guide and empower you for service and leadership. Amen. Amen. May the Holy Spirit fill you with the gifts you need. Amen. Amen. May the one whose love unites us as the body of Christ strengthen us to live and proclaim the gospel together. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I heard some hearty amens there.